All right, hi everyone, uh, good evening, and um, uh, welcome to the Science in Action Seminar Series. I would like to kind of introduce our next guest, Philip Noel San Victorias, was a student of mine in, um, uh, so Biology 230. He was kind of one of the students who was responsible for, uh, we had some chicken embryos that went a little bit too long, and became chickens. <laughs> and he became really attached to them that we find them a home somewhere. So uh, I became a, um, a parent of some chickens for a little while. So Philip, thanks for, for doing that for me. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting a lot better at not having the embryos last so long. <laughs> but uh, Philip is the classic Skyline student. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to say that his story is your story. His story, I you know, is, is coming from adversity and I think doing very well. And so I, I, you know, I was really glad when he said that he would come and talk to us. I was really glad about it because again, I see so many students who are so much like Philip in a lot of different ways, but I think he's a success story and I think we could all take to heart that success story that he has. So with that, I give you Philip. Thank you guys for having me today. Um, and a great introduction from Dr. Cap. Do you guys see my screen now? Yes, okay, perfect. So, um, so this, um, they were, they invited me to talk about my journey in Skyline and kind of like what I went through and kind of how I was able to find some success and kind of move on, you know, from diversity and failure and kind of seeing, you know, what kind of story I was to tell. I had a hard time kind of figuring out how exactly I wanted to frame this. And I talked to my friends a little bit because, you know, I felt like I didn't really have much to say, but it ended up that being that I did have a lot to say. <laughs> so um, a little bit about me. I just graduated from Berkeley with a degree in integrated biology. And that's basically, an integrated biology is basically their way of trying to frame biology in a different sense because they found, Berkeley found that it was a little, like most of the science degrees are a little too specific and they kind of wanted to take an approach that kind of put everything together and kind of try to train new scientists and researchers in a way that you're able to actually not only look at the details but also the bigger picture and kind of be able to ascertain kind of answer the scientific questions you're kind of tackling to be able to incorporate all the different ideas you were able to collaborate with and other students <clears throat> and, and other researchers. And like Cap said, I'm a, I'm a non-traditional student. Um, during high school, I used to go to School of the Arts and my passion was creative writing. But then I stopped that during my sophomore year and kind of started homeschooling for my last two years. And then afterwards, I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I kind of just was kind of going about life a little bit listfully and really having no idea uh, just because um, I was just really passionate about a lot of things and that's when I got into this I randomly looked upon this TED talk and it was by Emil Bapnik and she talked about a multi-potential person. And I resonated with that so much because one of the things about me that I've learned is that I have so many interests and so many passions. Like just recently, a couple years ago, I really got into photography and I wanted to do that. I spent so much money and I learned and I got really good at it. And I started doing some shoots with some people. But then a little bit after a while, I just kind of lost my passion with it and I moved on to the next thing. And in the past, it was things from like playing the piano, wanting to be an artist, kind of painting and doing creative writing that I kind of decided not to do. And so I've always had a varied interest of what I wanted to explore and what I wanted to be. And I've always struggled with that because I felt that everyone just had that one passion and one thing they wanted to do. And I was kind of, you know, confused in terms of like what, like if everyone had that, why couldn't I have that? And kind of what's wrong with me in a way? And so 
watching this TED talk really made me um, kind of have a more introspective look about who I am and kind of what I wanted to do. And this kind of capital, catapulted me to kind of exploring community college and going back to school and trying to figure out what it is I wanted to do. And I know a lot of, I said a lot about creative arts stuff and why I'm in science now is kind of a funny story. But um, so the next thing I want to talk about is my first semester at Skyline, which was terrible. <laughs> I actually failed a class. Oh, this is not a presenter mode. I just realized, sorry. Okay. And as you can see, I failed my first class. It was the culture of anthropology. And this class, the human biology class, was actually with Cap. I don't think he remembers me because I sat all the way at the back <laughs> and kind of um, just trying to absorb and kind of trying to figure out what it was I really wanted to do, but I struggled so terribly. I mean, this is not great. Enough, two W's and a B. It was kind of really bad. And the thing that really changed me from this experience was that in this class that I failed, um, I don't know why, but I decided to get my test anyways, knowing I was going to fail it. Um, I don't know why I did that, but I'm thankful that I did. Um, so I went to my professor and she kind of initiated the conversation with me like, hey, why did you fail? Why did you not do the paper? Why did you, you know, basically, she is, um, you can, she basically surmised that I basically guessed at all of my finals question and kind of what happened there. Um, she noted that, <clears throat> you know, while I was in class, I was pretty engaged and kind of paying attention for the most part. And then she just didn't feel that my result and kind of how I was at class really matched. And so she kind of asked me, like, why I failed. And I really had no answer for her. And so we started talking and I told her that I was, you know, it's been a while since I've been in school. It's been like, I want to say I graduated 2011, so it's been two years since I've been in school at this point. And, you know, I told her about my struggles, like I didn't really know how to study anymore, kind of what it kind of entailed. And, you know, being in school again was really, really hard. And so basically that's what happened. And from there, from that conversation, you know, she encouraged me to take the class again. And she encouraged me to, you know, take classes that I was that she thought I'd be interested in and she was really my first mentor and mentors are really important I'll talk about that in a little bit but you know that's one of the things that really changed my trajectory I feel because I was really discouraged after this semester feeling that I've you know really have not done well and kind of like what was wrong with me and so you know this is I feel one of the most important lessons to Kind of take is that when you fail it's not necessarily always um something that's a merit to you and kind of what is it doesn't inherently mean that it's that your failures is because it's entirely your fault i mean there's so many things that happen so many factors to take into account and so you know um <clears throat> always try to not let yourself get stuck in a hole because I think that is probably one of the worst parts. And I, and after this, I'll show you guys my complete transcript, <laughs> just because I think this will be really great to kind of see and kind of tell my story a little bit. So as you can see from my first semester here, that was when I failed. And then afterwards, with the same professor, I decided, I decided to take two classes because she was who I felt the most comfortable with. And also because I felt that anthropology at that point was something I really wanted to uh, move forward ahead in terms of like career and kind of what I wanted to do. And so I delved into that. And from there, I was able to, you know, start to get an understanding, especially from the break between fall and spring, we have that little Christmas break. So I spent a lot of my time thinking about what it is and how it is I what what I needed to succeed and kind of uh, and kind of what it need what what needed what I needed to really take seriously and kind of figure out what was my greatest strengths in terms of learning and in terms of 
motivation and kind of realizing what it was that he needed to succeed. And so after that semester, I was able to get all A's, which I was a little astounded by. And that kind of kept going on because I started to realize what kind of techniques I needed to do. Like one of the things that I started to do was like starting to sit in front of the class just, to, just because I felt that there's way too much distractions from everyone else. I used to be in the middle row kind of person, but after this semester, I started becoming the front row and kind of taking that <laughs> always and kind of realizing that was the best way for me to focus and stay engaged because, and also taking really meticulous notes. Um, I am the type of person who has seven different colored pens, highlighters, different notebooks, and kind of learning through that because one of the greatest things I've learned is once you spend the time and effort to actually, um, to actually pay attention for the first lecture, that's when after, and after that class, I usually try to review, and that's when you start to pick things up and things start to make sense. So that was one of the um, highlights that I've learned about myself is that I actually really hate reading things before class, and it's actually much better for me to actually read afterwards, after I've gained the lecture, just because I'm a very social person and I like interacting with people. So that interaction with the professor kind of really helped me in a way to connect all the concepts of trying to learn. But you know, everything isn't perfect, as you can see, during 2016 and fall 2016, and fall 2015, that was my first semester with CAP, or second semester with CAP, I did 230, and I got a B plus, but it's not great. <laughs> but you can see that I got a D plus in Gen Chem. Um, oh, and also one thing to note too, um, as you can see during fall 2014, and also my first semester, I took English honors and I withdrew that class two times. And it wasn't until uh, I started to kind of figure out that I had a certain type of style of learning. And so one of the things about that is that I started to kind of shop classes way before um, it was time to register. So what I had done was that I emailed every single English professor at Skyline and asked for the syllabus. Because one of the things I noticed during these two classes I dropped because I was so disinterested was the type of book and the type of class they wanted to run and the requirements they had. And so it wasn't until, um, when did I take the English class? I can't even see it. Over here, 2015 where I found this one professor, his theme for the class was zombies and fairy tales. And that to me instantly hooked me. And that was, you know, it allowed me to succeed and get an A in the class after so many trials and errors and I ended up taking it as an honors credit because he wasn't teaching the honors section. So that's one of the things I wanna share with you guys is to not be afraid to actually get syllabus in advance and kind of figure out like, would you even like the readings or would you even like the class beforehand? Because one of the things, um, and a great professor told me this, is that even though we're in school, it always feels like the professors are in charge of everything, but really we're in charge of our own schedule and our own learning. So you need to take it upon yourself to kind of, you know, figure out what it is that you like and how you like to learn and kind of what style and try to match that with your professor because that to me really um really just made everything the learning process so much easier especially when it's something that you really like and are interested in and so with that i was thought i was able to really you know find a way to match someone with my own personality and kind of be able to succeed in that way and from there on out, I started doing that with every single teacher, even after I transferred. I always ask for the syllabus in advance. Some professors don't do it, um, but some professors usually do respond and give it to you because, you know, I think it's a great way to kind of pick your classes. And so, you know, like I was saying, life isn't perfect. After fall 2015, I went through some personal stuff and kind of had a really hard time 
finding motivation just because I wasn't exactly sure what I, it is I wanted to do again. Um, it was only until I took, after I had taken a class with CAP, it was then I started to kind of uh, entertain the idea of wanting to be a scientist. And so feeling like I kind of was, I was kind of um, backtracking and kind of lost, I kind of was a little lost at this point in my life. And there were some other personal experiences that kind of, you know, depression and all of that, it really struggled for me. And getting the D in chemistry, for that experience, I actually opted to take the D in chemistry because I was a little competitive at that time and I was gonna get, um, I think a borderline between a C and a B. And at that point I was a little um, unsure if I wanted that on my transcript. So I actually, instead of, I think it was too late for me to get a W, I intended to bomb the final to get a D plus so I can retake it afterwards. I don't recommend that, <laughs> but it was something I had factored in too because if you do retake the class with a different professor, um, you are able to kind of not count that towards your entire GPA. So that was um, a calculated portion that I decided to do. And so I struggled for, I guess, almost a year to get back into school again and kind of um, trying to decide what it is. But at 2016, that was when I made the resolve to pursue the science and pursue becoming a scientist. I, I wish I could say um, a moment that I had this epiphany, but I think at that point I just had to make a decision because I'd spent so much time and it was something I knew I wanted to do anyways, or one of the possibilities. So I decided to take that on and kind of see where that led me. And I started enjoying most of my chemistry classes again, like you can see on, 2017, I took Chem 1 again, and I was able to get an A. These other two courses, I think I was trying to fill um, some sort of requirement, and I ended up hating the class, so I withdrew it. And so I was able to find success again, and I was able to continue on and push forward and kind of get A's again while still maintaining everything that I had done and kind of what I've learned about myself. And so I just want to say, you know, learning from your failures and kind of not forgetting that you have the power to get what it is you're learning. And to, you know, you're always there for yourself too. So always make sure that you're picking the classes and the professors you want to learn from and kind of figuring out what it is, is the best way for you to learn and, you know, and also reaching out and using your resources. Like that one time I just mentioned where my I had come into my professor to get my tests and we ended up having a conversation. After that moment, I started talking to my professors all the time. Sometimes I think as students, we often think that professors are always out to get you. They want to fail you. They want to make the hardest tests, but really they want you to succeed just as much as you want to succeed. So ever since that moment, I've always gone to office hours when I could. I talk to my professors and kind of get a gauge of what it is, what kind of professor they are and kind of what kind of a test giver they are too. And I think that's one of the important things to learn too. I always imagine tests as like first dates. You never know what you're gonna get. And you kind of try to prepare as much as you can. But after the first test, you kind of gain an idea of what kind of, test of your professors. And I think that's when you're able to fine tune. Usually for all my classes, my first test is always going to be the lowest and my midterm and my final tends to be much stronger than that just because I start to find kind of how, what kind of information they want to do. I mean, a lot of the science classes, they give you a ton of information. And after the first test, usually, I know it can be overwhelming, but try to figure out what kind of questions they ask, what kind of topics they focused on, how did they focus on that in terms of all the scheme of things. For the most part, you'll be able to see a pattern and kind of um, fine tune your studying and fine tune what sections it is you need to learn and you know, pretty much tailoring your studies to that specific professor. And I think that's one of the best things I've learned 
throughout my academic career and kind of, you know, what I want to impart to you guys. And don't be, you know, don't be afraid to explore your interests. Like you can tell from me, I started from anthropology. I did some creative writing stuff and I started to delve into, once I wanted to pursue a bachelor's in biology, I started to then delve into more of the science classes and focusing on that and then focusing on everything else after. And, you know, and always around with your friends, I think it's best always study with a group. You keep everyone accountable. If I think sometimes studying by yourself can be really hard. And I think it's really great to be able to share experiences with people as you're, you know, studying and all that and you're pretty much making sure you, everyone is kind of on point. Because one of the best things, especially in Berkeley, when I was taking anatomy, one of the hardest classes I've ever taken, it was only because I had made friends and kind of studied with them and continuously throughout the week and focusing on that to make sure, you know, everyone's accounted for and doing what they need to do and quizzing each other throughout the day. Like that kind of, you know, friendship is something you should always try to look for and find because for the most part, everyone is feeling the same way. Everyone's overwhelmed. <laughs> everyone's struggling. So, you know, trying to find a friend to grow up with is Group, group up with so you can survive. <laughs> that's how we like to imagine it. And I think that's what's one of the points that's really helped me. Well, Philip, there's a, a couple yeah. questions coming across on the uh, chat board yeah. that you may be interested in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give them to you. But uh, uh, how do you stay motivated when you start to feel school fatigue towards the end of the semester? Oh, for that, I... I mean, I think I experienced that too, for sure. Um, I mean, towards the end of the semester, one of the things I always try to look forward to is always the short break that we get. I mean, I'm definitely a type of person who has really good memory and I tend to kind of cleanse myself during winter break and of all the things I've learned. <laughs> so that's why I also have a tendency to always keep track of um, keep track of all my notebooks and all of my notes. Like I still have my tests from CAP and all of the notes I've taken since I've taken back in 2015 and all the tests that he's given me, which I may or may not have shared with some people, but <laughs> those are some of the things I do. Um, and always, I think getting to me, it started to become a game of always trying to get as high a grade of, as you can. I think that's one of the things too. I mean, I don't know. That's a hard a question. And definitely I think break <laughs> because breaks are good and being done is- I think So take a break and enjoy it, go out. Yeah, <laughs> and move break. on from the class, especially if it was one that you did not enjoy that much. Um, let's see, what are the things you look for in the syllabus? So one of the things I look for, um, is depending on the class. So for something from like an English class, I looked for the type of books we were gonna read. Um, for the science class, I tend to look for kind of their grading rubric and the amount of reading they um, recommend for, um, for the entire class. Like one class in Berkeley, I believe they had like 30 chapters of this one heavy biochemistry book. I mean, I had to take it otherwise, but that was, to me, it was something I would try to avoid and kind of try to see what policies that, um, <clears throat> and what kind of policies the professors had that would kind of work in your favor. Some professors tend to give, tend to drop test scores. If there's quizzes and all of that, there's, there's so many different things you can gain from the syllabus that you definitely try to take into factor whether you should take the class or not. But I think it's one of the best ways to kind of stay informed and kind of figuring out if the professor is, you know, one is that, that wants to be harder or wants to be, you know, really reading heavy is something I try to avoid. And also try to look for lectures online. There's lots of resources where people put up lectures of professors um, 
where professors just kind of dump everything and kind of trying to figure that out <laughs> is kind of hard. Okay, let me see. There's a, but yeah, that's one of the things I look for in the syllabus. Sounds like you, so one of the questions, it sounds like one of the things that really helped you was talking to a school counselor. This is an entirely free resource that is super helpful and only a small fraction of students take advantage of. How do we encourage taking advantage of this free and awesome resource? To me, I think one of the things about counselors and one I had to find out about myself too is trying to find a counselor that you're able to click with. I think one of the things schools can do is having a little personality or biography about counselors and kind of, so that way students can actually figure out, oh, are they gonna like this person or not? Like, is there something that we can connect on to kind of make each other relatable? Um, and that's one of the things too I did at Skyline was I went through three different counselors. One was an honors counselor and two other, I think one, there was two honors counselors and one was a counselor too. And I kind of went through the three of them to figure out who I liked the most. And I find out, and I found from one of them, um, my favorite one. And her name was Suzanne Poma. She's really great. I think if she's still working at Skyline, you guys should definitely try to connect with her because I think she's one of the most really relatable, personable people I've met through there. Um, during a pandemic and having a majority of our classes online, what advice would you have to keep your men mental stability in check? Um, so one of the things, and I talk about that later in my slides, is always keep your, in, your other hobbies and interests. School is not the only important thing in your life. So my last semester at Berkeley, um, two thirds of it was online. It was a huge struggle because um, one of the things about me is that I like to learn in lecture halls. I like to be in the front row and I like to take notes. So when they transitioned that all to online, it was a huge struggle for me. Um, I mean, and to be perfectly honest, I barely attended lectures at that point because to me, learning through Zoom and all of that was just not so incompatible to me that I had to find different avenues to do it. And so what I had ended up doing was, um, I ended up, um, Zoom calling a friend and we go, we go over all the lecture topics and kind of explain to each other what it was. And so you definitely have to find different avenues with that and kind of how to cope with it. And I definitely took more time, you know, spending time with my dog and talking to other friends who were also in different situations because, you know, talking about your struggles and kind of what you're dealing with kind of lends itself to finding solutions for it. So that's one of the things that, you know, really important when you're kind of struggling with your, ment your mentality towards classes and all of that. Um, what was, and another question is, what were some resources available at Skyland you found very helpful as a non-traditional student that hadn't been in school for a few years? Um, um, one of them was the Mesa Center I used a lot. Um, for the most part, I think during the early stages of my academic career in Skyline, I was pretty much alone and kind of stuck to myself. It wasn't until I started to, you know, start to kind of leap out of and try to talk to people in my classes that I started to make some friends. And with the Mesa Center, it was basically everyone who was all taking science classes. And at that point, um, it was kind of great to have friends who, you know, are kind of taking the same classes and experiencing it the same way. Like, I think it was one of the best places I was able to use. And a lot of people would give their opinion of professors that I would take into account and all of that, because, you know, everyone's schedule doesn't match up. But there's always advice given. And during my time there, the Mesa Center was really one of the greatest things I've used. And they, and I, you know, and... I think it was after three years, I didn't realize that I could go for scholarships. So it wasn't until the Mesa Center, I learned from that. And I was able to get some really good scholarships. So that's definitely one of the things that's one of the most important things I've done. I mean, resources I've used at Skyline. Um, and the professors too are really great resources. Um, you definitely want to familiarize yourself with them and kind of 
um, get to know them because they can open up a lot of opportunities for you. And especially when it comes to scholarships and, you know, job applications and, you know, for grad school, for PhDs and med schools, if you want to pursue that, um, you definitely want to reach out to them because I feel that a lot of recommendations for them, especially when you have a story to tell in your transcript is super important, especially because, you know, a lot of schools want to know that you're able to overcome diversity and overcome struggles and failures. Like being completely perfect and, and kind of zooming through everything is not always the most ideal candidate for positions. Um, let's see, integrated biology is a very large cross discipline involving such as physics, chemistry, and mathematics, and engineering. When you are studying, which specific branch were you, are you most interested in? By the way, what's your future plan? Um, let me see. What are, when you are studying, which specific branch are you most interested in? Um, to me, I was most interested in chemistry and definitely um, the biochemistry part of it and also the genetics part of it. Um, I was pretty much, I mean, I really like all of them. That's one of the things about me is that I definitely struggle with being able to pick one. And my future plan, I'm still a little unsure. I've been going back and forth to pursuing an MD or a PhD. Um, but I did apply to med school past summer. So hopefully we'll see how that turns out. And if I feel good about it when I get an acceptance letter. <laughs> um, let's see, how do you keep the positive and motivation to keep trying without giving up when you're frustrated with everything urgent to focus on? So definitely one of the things I found is that when you get super overwhelmed and stressed out and kind of frustrated with everything, you definitely need to take a step back and de-stress a little bit. I think as a student, we tend to, once we get into that bubble and kind of that hole that we feel all of these frustrations with, um, it's definitely a struggle to be able to get ourselves out. So one of the things I've learned is definitely take a break, whether it be a day or a couple of days, depending on urgent, hopefully you haven't put it off where you have to cram everything in two days. I mean, I used to do, I used to do that in my first couple of semesters and it was definitely not fun. There'd be times I pulled all-nighters, but once I changed that and kind of, um, kind of, uh, optimize my schedule a little bit more. It was definitely a lot better and changed the way I felt about my classes and studying. Um, how did you go about finding someone to grow up, grow up with? I feel a, a lot better in class when I have someone else to take it with, but majority of my friends are heading in a different major. Um, that's one of the great things about Skyline. I think if your major is definitely something in the science field, I mean, most of my friends are like, from Skyline are in, are in engineering, some of them are in computer science, some of them are doing um, forensic science, um, some are doing chemistry, and I did biology, some, a couple of us did biology. So definitely trying to find, that's why I really love the Mesa Center so much, is to find a place where you can meet these people so that, you know, um, so you can all kind of grow up together kind of like how you mentioned. Um, and then a question from Javier, what helped you during your first semester after transferring and what would you recommend avoiding? Um, let's see. So during my first semester, I was really anxious because I was like, oh, I'm gonna be this community college person going to this big university. How is it gonna be different? And honestly, my experience from Berkeley and the integrated biology and the professors I've taken it with is that really it's all the same. There's not that much difference between um, the level of difficulty and the level of interaction you need to. I mean, the classes are definitely bigger because it's, um, you know, it's, it is a public university and, you know, my class would have 200, 300 people. And even then, my best advice is to show up early to all the classes and sit in the front row because if you're behind 300 people, there's so much stimulation you can get from everyone's laptops, everyone's books, everyone's hair, everyone's clothes. You definitely do not want to be in that situation when you're trying to absorb the class and kind of try to figure that out. But hopefully you guys, when you guys transfer, hopefully COVID is 
you know, on demand and we won't have to do online instruction too much because that that's definitely something I felt was really hard. Let's see, and Diana asked me how I dealt with burnt out, if any. Um, I was definitely burnt out after my first semester at Berkeley because my first semester there, I ended up taking biochemistry and it was not an easy class. That was one of the, I talked about it earlier. Um, it was basically every test had like 10 plus chapters and you kind of had to absorb that in a way. And the professors I took it with, um, the head professor was kind of mean in a way that he basically said everything's fair game. There was no study, there was no study guides. There was no anything like, oh, the study guides. Try to find a professor who gives us study guides because those are the best. As they use, they're probably most likely include that in the syllabus. Um, so that's one of the things I knew really worked really hard for that class to try to get an A. And then thankfully I was able to, but after that semester, I was so burned out. After a couple of weeks when break started, I just wanted to be alone and kind of sleep and kind of just do mundane things for a while. So, I mean, to me, burnout, whenever you experience it, I feel you definitely need a break where you're just not reading anything. And I feel that's one of the things I found a little hard during my academic career because I used to be an avid reader. And one of the things I haven't been able to do was read books for fun because when you read books for your, a whole week and all these material you're always reading it's hard to be able to read things at least for me to be able to read something for enjoyment so that's one of the things i wanted to do so heidi asked me talk a lot about social aspects of learning and importance in your learning process what advice do you have for a wave of students who have significantly limited opportunities to build these strong social relationships um what do you mean by limit, is limited opportunities in terms of because we're in a pandemic? Um, if that's the case, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I have to think on that. Um, on a scale of one to how helpful we're meeting during office hours. I think it's depending on the professors. I definitely think it's, to me, it's a 10. Um, if it's a professor that's really good. Because um, hmm. to me, I mean, once you build that relationship with the professor, I always try to go a couple of times to kind of see and kind of gauge who they are and how they react towards my own personality. And when you're able to find a connection that kind of clicks for you, I tend to go for the most part every time I mean, I still talk to Cap about advice on like what I need to do and kind of what I should consider. And, you know, even after five years, I still talk to him. And I think, you know, once you build that reputation, oh, okay, I, okay. <laughs> once you build that reputation, you kind of want to be able to keep that going because, you know, not every professor is someone you're going to be like. So it's, to me, that difficulty is, I mean, the helpfulness is definitely dependent on that. What kind of jobs can a person apply for if they graduate with a biology degree? How about um, So I was able to apply to research associate positions because I had research experiences. And so it was pretty hard to find a job after graduating, especially during this time when it was COVID. And so, you know, I was, thankfully I was able to find one after a while. I mean, it took me six months, but you're able to, and it was, and it's pretty great from one of the, for the most part, a lot of the entry level ones um, from my friends and all that, usually it's minimum $25 an hour. So it's definitely a good place to start after graduation. Um, let's see, the last question, have you had a difficult professor? If so, how did you go about that class? Um, in terms of difficulty, I did have one and it was just a professor I ended up not going to office hours with and kind of not really building rapport with them and relationship with them. So I ended up not, really going then kind of studying on my own with my friends and kind of using my friends as like a leverage in terms of the interaction that I try to make with professors. And so that's why I find, you know, making friends in the same class always to be super important. Even if it's just one, it keeps you guys accounted, um, accountable and keeps you guys on your toes. Okay, let's see. And so balancing everything, I kind of talked about this already through everyone's questions. 
And so for me, my own hobbies were knitting and my dog. And through that, I was able to meet really important people. Um, one second. And through that, you know, that's why I always never let yourself kind of, never let yourself um, be only doing one thing. Don't always be doing school because it opens up different avenues for you when you're able to do other hobbies. And so, because you're able to meet so many different people and it's really important that you do. And so my mentors and why they're important, <laughs> you can see there's Dr. Cap. Um, so one of, so on the top, on the top left, um, that's Jane Miles. I, I met her through knitting and she's, she used to be a VP at Genentech. And that's why I think it's super important to keep your circles really expandable and open because she's been super important um, in my transition from school to the industry and kind of figuring out what it is I need to do, interview tips. I mean, and it was just by random chance. So I, you know, one of my advice to you guys is to kind of <clears throat> reach out and talk to people because you're meeting, I mean, we're in the location where everyone is there's so many variable people and so many different companies and so many different avenues that they're doing and they're all super interesting. And I think with our, in our generation of people, we tend to not want to talk to other strangers because it's, I don't know, weird or something, but, you know, my hobbies kind of open up to me, open up to meeting her and she's been one of the important mentors in my life. And she's definitely helped me navigate my future career trajectories and kind of what I wanted to do. And Basically, um, she's been a great help and a great resource. I mean, when you need a VP of Genentech, you definitely want them in your side, right? <laughs> and right after her, that's Dr. Vasquez Medina. He was one of the professors I really enjoyed with. Um, I took physiology with him, and that's also another class that I failed. I got a D in that the first time and an A afterwards. So I have a recurring theme of that. And he's been really helpful. He was able to write me a letter of recommendation. And that's one of the things too, when you transfer, don't be afraid of the professors too. One of the things, especially in Berkeley, um, at least from my experience, was that a lot of these professors were just, you know, they're doing like really amazing work. And at the same time, most of them are researchers and they're not really, sometimes they're not the best for teaching. But for the most part, always try to reach out to them because sometimes you find someone you're able to really click with and it's been a great oh it's been a great um, resource to me in terms of being able to kind of navigate the future and like the research and all of that stuff and this is Lori Slickton and she was the professor who I failed my first semester at Skyline and was able to help me and you know I've taken every single class of hers and she's been really great I still talk to her she's also a beekeeper and sometimes I get honey from her <laughs> and there's Dr. Cap. he basically started my entire scientific career my first lab I mean my first class with him was 215 um, and I also did the the AMSA club with him and so he really opened up my world in the science field and kind of started me in the research I was dissecting chickens and embryos of chickens for a long time. I could not eat chickens for a while after that. <laughs> so it was really a great experience. And we did some molecular cloning too, which was really fun. So always, you know, make the professors you talk to, they're always gonna give you opportunities if you ask. So always make a relationship with them no matter what and try to find a way to gain an opportunity. And right after him, that's, um, Dr. Forbes, she was a chemistry professor at Skyline. I feel that she moved recently to another college. She was great. Um, I still use her I, for advice. We have an email going on whenever I have questions for chemistry all the way to biochem. She, was, she has a PhD in organic chemistry. So even after Berkeley, I was still keeping in touch with them. And right after her, that's Dr. Joaquin Rivera. He was the organic chemistry professor, I think he still teaches. I always suggest to take him. I think he's really great. Um, we had a lot of fun in his class. Our OCHEM was the first class we had, there was like less than 10 people. So our group got really close and we, you know, we still talk all the time. 
And then lastly, this is Emma Steigerwald. She was my main PI in my lab in Berkeley. She's been, and she's a graduate student there. So she's been kind of helping me fine tune my scientific method and kind of how to approach these things. Cause that's one of the things I feel sometimes undergrad doesn't really prepare you to just cause the way some of the classes are structured, it's always about, um, it's always about memorization and kind of the things there. It's not, all, it's not only until you get into a research lab where you're able to exercise that knowledge. And she's kind of been helping me along the way to kind of fine tune that kind of using all that I've learned. And I think it's really funny sometimes though, where, where someone poses me a question, I'm able to kind of ascertain an assumption just based on what I've learned throughout um, my classes and all that. And I think that's always a fun thing to do or have its experience because I think, you know, all that you learn is actually amounting to something. And one thing too about mentors and why they're important, they not only, you know, give you opportunities, but they are someone you can seek advice from because they know the way you perform in classes and how you are in lab, especially when you don't know what to do and kind of don't know what kind of avenue you want to take. They definitely are a resource where they're, you're able to gain a, an information about a different perspective on you and how they view you. So don't be afraid to ask like, oh, you know, do you think I should do this? Like, what do you think I should do? Or how do you see me? And kind of like that. A lot of these people have offered me that advice and kind of, you know, um, a lot of them pretty much told me that I shouldn't go to med school and that I should get a PhD because I can do better work there. <laughs> so, and that's something that I found really funny that they all, seven of them have the same idea about me. And that's one of the things that made me really hesitant about med school. I still decided to try out just in case. Um, so that's definitely one thing you want to keep in mind when talking and finding them. Because I think that perspective is really important because we're not always sure about how we're able to, you know, kind of see ourselves and kind of see our aptitudes and our talents. That's definitely something that your mentors are really, and friends too, are able to um, um, impart in you and kind of let you know. And so the research I've done, um, my first experience after Skyline, I did a lot of research with CAP. Um, I didn't want to cover it because I didn't want to um, go over time. But um, my first research, research um, after Skyline was in my physiology lab. Um, it was a really great experience. And one of the things we did was look at the development of fine motor skills. And this is one of the greatest examples of always trying to incorporate something that you love with something in science or whatever. And the way I did this um, was through knitting, because I'm a knitter and I love it. So one of the things I did was look at the muscles that, um, that was incorporated in knitting. It's usually the fine motor skills. So that's your brachial radialis that basically controlled most of your fingers there. And so we recruited some subjects who've never knitted before. And we gave them a set of repetitions and we used an EMG to measure the muscle activity uh, while they're resting and then while they're actually moving. And so you can see these are my fellow students. There they are knitting. I think this video doesn't work. I'm not sure, but <laughs> I think we might have taken it down. But so that's one of the things of incorporating your own interests with science. And I think I always advocate for that. I think it makes things learning easier because it made me more interested in reading about EMGs and kind of how we measure those and kind of, you know, more research into fine motor skills and development of that. And so here were the results. I was um, subject number one. You can see that mine went up a little bit. That's probably just because we weren't super precise of where we put the EMGs on. Um, and then subject four and five were a little particular because they basically did not do the assigned um, repetitions we gave them to. So they, did, they really didn't see any improvements and we kind of nulled them out. And that's something that happens when you do research, especially when you're working with people. Sometimes you can't depend on them to do what it is you instruct them. And so from these two, participant number two and three, you can definitely see that there's been a difference in muscle activity. And the way muscle activity works is that basically um, 
it should lessen over time because your muscle memory is taking more, um, it's basically taking more of the work as opposed to your actual brain. So you can see like subjects two and three had a decrease of that. And that was when, because after a week, they started to develop muscle memory and kind of trying to, the, the brain was basically trying to exert less on their fine motor skills. And so that was really interesting to see that. Minor crease, because yeah, I, I wait, already talked about that. So we looked at the root mean square difference of that. And so it was really great and kind of, you know, um, a huge highlight that you're able to accomplish so much in just one week of work, especially for participant number three. So don't be afraid to pick up new skills because, you know, it just takes some time and dedication to really figure that out. And so with my work in the Evolution Genetics Laboratory, we were looking at climate change and how it affects certain species. Um, our species of interest was Pleurodema marimatum. Um, it's this frog in Peru that hibernates under snow caps. So you can imagine uh, with global warming that the snow caps are usually used to is starting to become in higher, higher elevation. And so we were looking at the dispersal rates and kind of what they did and how they were able to travel and their genetics on it. Because once, you, once the frogs are starting to get into higher, higher elevation, you can imagine that you're getting a little bit of founder's effect and bottlenecking because then they're not gonna be able to disperse as much with other genes and all of that. So we were trying to look at the effects of that. And one of the other things um, we also did in this lab was we looked at certain pathogens and it was with this specific frog as well. And so what we wanted to do was to see if any of the susceptibility was we were able to ascertain in terms of, you know, like, oh, um, are the genetics of the higher elevated elevation frogs now are you being more susceptible to the pathogen or not? And chytrid meiosis, chytrid meiosis is this pathogen that's kind of eradicating a lot of the amphibian populations throughout the world because it's being basically spread around by humans through so like cargo containers, shipping containers, ships, and all of that. So its effect is pretty widespread. And our lab is also doing work on that in the West Coast and kind of um, collaborating with other labs to figure it out. And one of um, our results here, and this graph was actually made from R. And one of the things about science now is they're incorporating a lot of coding. So I would definitely implore you guys to explore more coding because you're using coding to answer and kind of fine tune and dig through all the data. You can see that we have a ton of data here. I would hate to do that in Excel. That would be horrible. But um, so coding all that. And for this graph um, specifically, I was looking at the weight of each individual frogs and if there's sex, if we could find any correlation there. As you can see, there's a ton of our samples who don't have uh, the pathogen. And it seems, I mean, we, we can base, from this graph, we were basically able to kind of correlate that perhaps the younger they are, the more susceptible they are. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly why or what. But basically we're using weight to correlate with their age as older frogs tend to be heavier. And I was trying, and I added sex as a variable just to see if there was anything to highlight. But there wasn't really much in terms of being able to um, figure out. So our next step was to basically send in um, our individual pathogen samples for sequencing, kind of figuring out how they mutate and all of that different stuff, along with sequencing the genome of our frog and kind of seeing what changes it is um, that happens throughout the samples, kind of figuring out from there through the elevation gradient. And unfortunately, after I graduated, um, I was able to work with them for a couple more months until like June or July, but afterwards I had to take my leave and I'm not able to continue on because I graduated. So that was a shame, but it was really fun to be able to work um, in a university lab. And so what sucks for me, um, right now I was able to gain a position at Genentech. Um, I'm working in the gene therapy lab and CRISPR lab. We're using them to explore different, um, knocking in and knocking out different genes in mouse and kind of mice and kind of seeing 
how that changes. And I only started last week, so I don't have a lot of information yet, so I'm still learning there. But yeah, so that's the end of my talk. Let's see, do we have any more questions? Well, Philip, I mean, I think you got the most questions that I've seen in some of these things. They were just kind of rapid fire on you. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for keeping your talk in, in time. Yeah. And that's Maybe. funny. I know Jane, uh, her son, uh, her son and my kids kind of went to school together. So. Yeah, you know, we also have a different mutual friend, <laughs> Sandy. Sandy also is a knitter. Uh-huh, okay. Sandy teaches... Um, I think in the Pacific schools. I know she taught both of your. Uh, yeah, she's. She, I think she's retired now. So, oh, she's yeah, I know. Wow, so that's amazing. I, I just. I'm sorry. I just can't get into to to knitting. <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> I appreciate what people who knit do, though. So it's yeah. It's cool. So Maybe so you got your job. So one of the reasons why you got your job is through knitting. Yeah. Well, no, I didn't use Jane as a contact for this Genentech position. <laughs> okay. 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 I, I think Gen, I think Jane has already left Genentech and she's working with Covans, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's out now. So. But. Yeah. Maybe we could also double back to the question um, that we asked for clarification on the one that came from Heidi about. Uh, the social aspect of learning and its importance in the learning process. Any advice that you would have for students who have significantly limited opportunities to build these strong social relationships? And, you know, let's put it in the context of uh, shelter in place and COVID right now. Right. Um, I mean, to me, I mean, I've, I assume most professors are still doing office hours, even though it's through Zoom. I definitely would do that, you know, keep your camera on. A lot of people, you know, pretty much hate not seeing a face. And a lot of professors were, you know, requesting that. And, you know, you're still able to talk to them, emailing them too. I mean, doing shelter in this place, I emailed a lot of my professors and still have a stream of conversations going through. Um, definitely is setting up Zoom calls with professors and mentors. I tried to set up a couple with CAP. I think my schedule's never aligned. <laughs> but, you know, that's something you can always do. And I think, you know, it's a nice way to kind of um, kind of bridge the gap, I guess, so to speak. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just for the sake of uh, everyone's time, I'm going to go ahead and cut the recording now. Um, Philip, thank you so much for taking your time uh, yeah. and being so open uh, with sharing your experiences, um, some advice, wisdom. Really, really appreciate it. The students were absolutely loving it and so um we have this as a recording and with uh philip's permission we can put it up onto our youtube playlist uh, for all uh, other <laughs> students who are not able to make uh -huh. it to check it out of course we'll be uh, blurring out the transcript uh in the editing process oh okay yeah we'll sure that, i mean uh, that's totally fine with me hey, philip i got a question with all those yeah. withdrawals and stuff that you had how did you get into berkeley with uh, kind of that GPA and that, you know, did you have a good story? I mean, what what helped? Because you know, a lot of a lot of my yeah. students, they get a B in my class, and they're like, "I'm not going to be able to get into Berkeley," and I'm like, "Right, no." So what no, what'd you yeah. do? What happened? Um, so in my application, they you know they asked specific things, and it's definitely one of the things I highlighted during my essays was kind of my journey and kind of what happened. And it's funny because my dad actually had a contact at Berkeley is. Um, admissions um, department. He actually asked, like, what factor got me in. I don't know why he did that, but he did that. And he asked, and the person told him it was my essays. And so, you know, definitely don't discount things because I definitely felt the same way when, you know, I have so many withdrawals, there's some classes I failed. And, you know, ultimately, I think if you, if you're just truthful and you don't try to blemish things and let people know, um, you know, because the people who are reading this are people too, and people who have feelings and all that, and you know, experiences. They're going to be able to relate to that, and they're going to be able to understand where you come from and kind of, you know, how you've 
were able to still find some success, if not, you know, through so many different things. So I think that's one of the things that I was able to do and articulate in my essays. But yeah, I did end up, um, I think my GPA entering Berkeley was 3.8, but I was really worried about a lot of my withdrawals. Um, but thankfully it was something, you know, I was able to explain to them and they were able to, you know, be able to figure out that it's not just my record. You know, it's not just the grades and everything. Yeah. 